Now to coronavirus and the battle to reopen schools and universities. Few have more experience with this dilemma than our next guest, Janet Napolitano. She was the first female president of California's sprawling public university system. She was also the first female secretary of Homeland Security under President Obama, among other things, dealing with the outbreak of the H1N1 swine flu. She talks to our Walter Isaacson about what her university is doing to help students at this time and what the White House should be doing to save American lives. Thank you, Christian and Janet Napolitano. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Walter. Congratulations on a what seven-year run. So, uh, and you're leaving in a very difficult moment. Tell me how the changing situation this week on coronavirus is affecting how you're going to reopen the University of California's 10 campuses. So we're actually uh, uh, reimagining how we're going to reopen. Two of our campuses open in August. That's Merced and Berkeley. The others don't open until the end of September, so they have a bit more time. But for Berkeley and Merced, we're really having to go back and uh, revisit um, the density of the dorms uh, that will be safe, uh, revisit uh, the number and types of classes that can be offered in person. I think the bulk of the academic program uh, will be uh, online uh, by, uh, by necessity, uh, but uh, we still want to have some in-person uh, classes to the extent that we can do so safely. So we had some initial plans um, in the beginning of July. Uh, the resurgence uh, happens and you have to be agile and flexible in these circumstances. So we're going to go, uh, uh, like I said, revisit what, what had been originally planned. Why bring people back at all? You know, um, partially because there are just some classes that are better in person. Uh, certain, for example, laboratory classes, uh, classes that are in the performing arts or the studio arts, where there is a significant and unique uh, value add to being in person. And then the advantage of uh, having uh, small classes where there can be not just classroom uh, instruction, but facilitating the kind of off-class uh, conversation that really goes into the university experience. And so that's part of it. And then in terms of dormitory living, we have uh, students for whom uh, the dorm is actually the best place for them to live. They may not have an adequate uh, housing situation otherwise. And also we know that uh, dormitory life is part of uh, what, what young people want out of college uh, or out of colleges and universities like the University of California. So uh, we want to facilitate that to the extent we can. Do you get a lot of pushback from parents who say, hey, wait a minute, this is not what we signed up for. Give us our money back, you know, if you're not going to take our kids into campus. Yeah, well, well, we've been sued a couple of times. Uh, um, we did uh, provide refunds for housing and dining last spring when we had to uh, uh, shut down uh, rapidly due to COVID. Um, in terms of uh, tuition, the way we view it is that tuition is really designed to pay for the faculty uh, and to pay for the uh, delivery of educational content so that students can make progress towards their degrees. And uh, it, it's, it's not specifically tied to being uh, in-person or online or remote or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we think the, the fundamentals for why tuition is charged and how it's calculated still remain. And so uh, we have no current plans to reduce tuition. Should we use this crisis, though, to rethink fundamentally the financial model for higher education? Maybe go online a whole lot more or just change the notion of what research universities should be doing? I think that uh, definitely uh, lessons learned in terms of how we do online instruction uh, uh, will now be a permanent part of the University of, of California. But I think um, uh, we should view them 
as a supplement to and not a substitute for uh, the residential college experience. Um, I think what we're learning here is that there are values to uh, being a, a, a student at a residential uh, university, uh, values in the social interactions between students and students and faculty and staff, uh, uh, the participation in extracurricular activities, the ability to take a conversation from in the classroom and keep talking while you're walking down the hall to the dining room and keep it going there. Uh, and, and that value add um, is uh, something that uh, we should not want to lose as a country. Um, uh, it's a great time of uh, for social maturation of uh, uh, 18 to 22 year olds. But again, Walter, I do think that um, uh, the pedagogy, the way we teach um, uh, will, will change uh, in light of what we've learned during the COVID uh, crisis. You all, the California system and many other universities are suing the Trump administration for a new uh, immigration enforcement rules saying that uh, foreign students can't have their visa extended uh, if they're at a place that's doing mainly online learning. Why push back on that? Why should the visas be extended if most of the learning is online? Well, because uh, international uh, students at, at the University of California, they, um, they are students, but they're also research assistants, they're teaching assistants, um, uh, they're a vital part of uh, the the graduate education at the University of California. And really the Trump administration rule uh, was an ill-considered you know, lever to force colleges to, uh, uh, to um, not do online learning and to reopen as if the virus doesn't exist or we're already through the, the pandemic. Um, uh, and there was no thought given to uh, the role that international students play in American higher education, and it's an important role. You and others at the University of California have now endorsed a proposition that will be on California's ballot to repeal uh, Proposition 209, which banned affirmative action. Do you think we should now, especially in the light of what's happened uh, after George Floyd's death, uh, use race as a consideration when determining who gets admitted to colleges? I think it should be a consideration. You know, at the University of California, our admissions officers review a student according to 14 different criteria. They want to evaluate the whole student. Um, they want to evaluate um, how the student would contribute to the university should they be admitted. Uh, the only thing they can't uh, look to is the student's race, gender, or ethnicity, uh, which is a, a, a key part of a student's identity. It's such an artificial limitation. Um, so I hope that the ban on uh, using that, uh, those factors is repealed by the California voters in November. You also are trying to drop the ACT test, the SAT test. Is that so that you get more racial diversity? What's the reason for dropping standardized tests like that? This actually started with uh, a request I made to the faculty back in 2018 to evaluate the use of the SAT or ACT in UC admissions. Faculty came back, uh, recommended continued use of the SAT, um, for a period of years uh, during which the university would develop its own test, um, an, its own test designed to measure whether students had mastered the preparatory coursework we require of um, applicants from California to the University of California. Um, uh, I looked at it and uh, the way I saw it was we were doing all of these things in our admissions process to mitigate for the simple fact that there's this correlation between SAT and um, a, a, a student's basically zip code, um, uh, the income level of their families. And uh, we, we were doing all of this work to try to 
you know, erase that implicit bias in the test. Uh, and then in the end, the test didn't give us all that much better knowledge of how a student would do at the University of California. So um, uh, I just thought, you know what, it is time to wean ourselves away from use of the SAT. So we're not going to do it all, all in one fell swoop. We're going to be test optional for two years. Many universities across the country are going to be test optional because of the interruption caused by COVID. Test optional means a student can submit a score, um, but if they don't submit a score, they're not penalized for that. Uh, then we'll be two years test blind. What that means is that if a student submits a score, the score can be considered for something like course placement, but it cannot be used in the actual admissions decision. And then by 2025, we won't use the SAT at all. What are the fundamental moral and educational reasons to take race into account when you're admitting students? You know, we're a public university, and I think a public university has a public responsibility um, to be open and accessible, um, to be a, a creator of opportunity. And I think what the country is recognizing now in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and, and the protests that have occurred since then is that uh, the issue of racism in our country it's not gone away. It's not magically disappeared. Um, it's gonna require some focus and intentionality uh, to, uh, for our country to meet its aspirations for equality. Um, and so for a university like the University of California, uh, I think it means we have to make special effort and recognize that r racism has uh, affected students uh, uh, of different colors and creeds um, throughout their upbringing. Uh, and we need to cut through that and make sure that, you know, our student body is as diverse as it can be. You were Secretary of Homeland Security and you took on the H1N1 flu epidemic. What did you learn from that and what lessons from that are not being applied today? The number one lesson learned, I think, in H1N1 was the importance of clear and consistent science-based communication with the public uh, so that the public knows uh, what it needs to do and what it can expect. I mean, in H1N1, the members of the cabinet who were involved, myself, Secretary of HHS, uh, Sibelia, Secretary of Education, uh, Arnie Duncan, when we spoke with the press, uh, uh, we spoke only in terms of uh, what we were being told by uh, the CDC, the, the importance of hand washing and, and hand washing properly, uh, the importance of coughing into your elbow. Very basic tools that the public then could use to its own advantage. Uh, the, the next thing we learned during H1N1 uh, was uh, um, that pandemic planning really matters. We were able to use the playbook that had been developed during the Bush administration um, and uh, uh, adapt it to H1N1, but we didn't need to start from scratch. Uh, and then uh, thirdly, uh, I think we learned a lot about um, vaccine and vaccine manufacture. You know, the first uh, case in the United States uh, was uh, found in April of 2009. Uh, by the next fall, uh, we had a national uh, vaccine campaign underway. Uh, we were able to move very, very swiftly there. Now, it was different than a coronavirus, which is a much more difficult um, um, organism to create a vaccine for than H1N1, which was a form of flu. But nonetheless, uh, um, we put a lot of energy into not just the development of the vaccine, but having a vaccine distribution plan. Why can't we match the success of other countries that have pretty much successfully uh, 
gotten to very low numbers? Well, we had that opportunity. Uh, we let it go. Uh, we were slow to the ball. Um, uh, uh, we were slow to the ball on testing. Uh, we were slow to the ball in terms of establishing supply chain for critical uh, reagents used in testing. Uh, things like PPE, uh, personal protective equipment for hospitals. Um, it's still chaos out there. Um, and uh, we have been absolutely, in, in, in my view, um, misguided in terms of any communication coming from uh, uh, the White House in terms of what the country should do and what is expected of the citizens of this country. We all have a role to play here. Um, and so uh, um, that chaos, that lack of leadership has had a real impact on our public health response. You were governor of Arizona. That state's getting walloped right now. Oh, What's happening God. and what went wrong there? Oh my gosh, yeah. I follow Arizona closely and um, uh, I think that's an example of a state that never really shut down and uh, when it reopened, reopened far too widely, far too quickly. And when you look at the resurgence of virus there, the ICU beds are at capacity. Uh, the trajectory keeps going up. Uh, um, that, that is a state that probably should consider going back into shutdown mode. Uh, governor Doug Ducey, a Republican, you were a Democratic governor. Has this become so partisan that he has not even consulted with you, or have you been talking to him? Uh, I haven't not spo I've not spoken with uh, Governor Ducey, but, you know, I'll tell you, Walter, um, this is a public health crisis. It should not be a partisan health crisis. And uh, one thing I do fault the uh, administration, the Trump administration for, is seeing everything through a political lens. Um, this virus affects Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, uh, your ICU bed capacity doesn't depend on how many Democrats or Republicans are in your state. Um, uh, wearing a mask is a common sense um, intervention that can really reduce the frequency of virus. How this got wrapped into Democrat versus Republican politics, uh, I think hindsight will, not hindsight, even now will teach us is just the wrong way to approach it. Are you being uh, vetted to be uh, Joe Biden's running mate in this election? Uh, uh, not to my knowledge, no. <laughs> guess you would know, right? I guess I would know, yeah. Okay. Janet Napolitano, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Walter.